What, what dosing, do you give your clients any recommendations on dosing for liver? Do you let them do it intuitively? This comes up all the time and we can both address it from our own perspectives. Is there a concern for vitamin A toxicity in pregnancy? Uh, it's a really interesting rabbit hole, but I'd love to get your take on it. Yeah, I'm intuitive always. And it's kind of interesting when I start with that in my conversations with my clients, when I say, you know, go and if, you know, if they're eating raw liver or if they're taking the pills, like go and see what it is that you need. Like if you're taking the pill, like put three in your hand and see how that feels and then put like four in your hand and see how that feels. And then if you feel like you need more later in the day, add more and later in the day. And that's definitely like not a standard way to make a recommendation for any type of supplement or medication. Um, but I think it takes away our intuitive power. So as much as I would love to like fully have medicine step back into that, I don't think it will ever happen, but if we can start planting those seeds, I think it's essential. Um, the, the vitamin A toxicity is definitely something that comes up. And then I also always hear like, well, what about the liver being the filter for all the toxins? And does that mean that, you know, we're getting all the toxins from the liver and, um, there's just so much misinformation out there. And, you know, I would love if you addressed the vitamin A and then I don't know if you want to move into the copper part of it too, but there's, there's this vitamin A copper toxicity thing that just keeps looming. I feel like on social media that, that, you know, that's just like the number one kind of fear that people have around this. Yeah, it is. It is interesting. So my perspective on liver is that it's not a filter. It's like, I think we're both pretty safely in that camp. Uh, I think most people who understand human physiology know that the liver is not a filter. It doesn't act like a sieve. This is not, I, I don't think many people listening to this podcast eat pasta or spaghetti, but this is not a sieve catching the spaghetti after you've cooked it. And your, your liver isn't just full of toxic spaghetti that it's caught, you know, and filtered out of your body. Uh, the liver is a, is a enzymatic factory that, that biotransforms things. So it'll take compounds that are toxins and it'll make them water soluble or it'll bioconvert them so that you can excrete them or you can bind them. And so basically it prepares them for excretion. So it takes one widget and it changes the shape of that widget and then it exports it out the back door and that's either poop or pee, but the liver doesn't really store those things at all. So you're not going to accumulate toxins in the liver. Having said that, the sources of the liver is important because if, if, if it's a poorly fed cow or a cow from a toxic area, of course, they're going to have more toxins in the body, but the liver generally doesn't hold on to toxins. Um, some people would say heavy metals, but if you look at it, so there's a farm that I love in Georgia called White Oak Pastures, and they've sent me their analysis of heavy metals in the organs. The kidneys actually store more heavy metals than the liver. The liver is pretty low in heavy metals. And so I think that I don't, I, the kidneys are not incredibly high, but the kidneys are higher than the liver. So when I tell people it's, you know, I'd say eat less kidney than you do liver or eat, you know, eat a marginal or a small amount of kidney. Kidney is still valuable, I think, for a lot of people, especially perhaps people with urinary issues or people that want vitamin A in smaller doses. The kidney is also a source of di DAO, which is diamine oxidase, which is a, a valuable antihistaminergic thing for people that have uh, sort of histamine problems and they're trying to work those out. But um, I'm not saying the kidney is toxic, just that the kidney is even higher in heavy metals than the liver, and neither of them are very high in general. So the liver is, is pretty darn safe, especially from a good source like uh, white oak pastures. In terms of the vitamin A uh, levels, I think that the, the recommendations are less than 10,000 IUs for a pregnant woman per day, which is fine. You can stay below 10,000 IUs by eating less than two ounces of liver per day, if my, if my calculations are correct. I think that's right. I think uh, an ounce of liver has a little more than 5,000 IUs of vitamin A per day. So I don't even think pregnant women need, need that much liver. I think I'd be happy if a pregnant woman is getting half an ounce of liver throughout the week or an average of three and a half ounces per week is plenty for most women in terms of the liver. You could go a little higher if you wanted to do an ounce a day, that's seven ounces per week. But I don't think pregnant women need a whole lot more liver than that per week. Um, and that's well below those recommendations. If you go down the rabbit hole, and I've done a few podcasts on that, uh, it's, it's questionable whether higher doses of vitamin A would even be problematic for um, women with uh, with the babies. And I think that in general, it's pretty safe to say that vitamin A deficiency is 10 to 100 to 1,000 times more common than a vitamin A toxicity. Having said that, I don't recommend that people eat six pounds of liver or go in search of carnivore liver or polar bear liver. There's this, there's this anecdotal um, sort of wives tale, or I should say urban myth about, uh, it's actually not an urban myth, just this urban legend of polar bear liver, which actually does have quite a bit of vitamin A, but I believe it has literally a hundred times more vitamin A than a cow's liver. So you can imagine one ounce of cow's liver is equivalent to 100 
ounces of polar bear liver or, or you know, excuse me, I reversed those. So, you know, one uh, ounce of polar bear liver is a hundred ounces of cow's liver. That's an insane amount. So even, you know, when you're looking at that level, you know, two orders of magnitude higher vitamin A and polar bear liver, that could give somebody vitamin A toxicity, but I don't think anybody's eating a hundred ounces of liver or pounds of liver per day chronically. Yeah. That's where you might run into issues. I think if you're doing that intuitively, you would never do that. Like that's I think not so. something that I think someone it, would intuitive. strive for, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think the intuition would be really helpful there. Yeah, and then and then in terms of the copper thing, um, copper is interesting. A lot of people might be copper deficient. DAO is a copper dependent enzyme, so diamine oxidase in the human body is copper dependent. Um, there's superoxide, which is a zinc copper uh, dependent enzyme, so superoxide dismutase is an important uh, enzymatic uh, is an important enzyme that has to do with sort of the antioxidant system in the body, and that is dependent on copper. Copper is essential for human life. It's just getting the Goldilocks amount. And liver does have a lot of copper, but liver also has a lot of zinc, which should balance the copper. I think if you're eating liver in those moderate amounts, you won't get copper toxic. But very few people talk about copper deficiency. Um, and I think that that is also an issue for people. One thing that comes up increasingly now in the post-viral or the world that we live in post COVID is that people are taking lots and lots of zinc as a supplement because they believe mm -hmm. some and somewhat rightly so that a lot of people are not getting enough zinc probably because they're not eating enough muscle meat. Uh, but if you take a lot of unopposed zinc, you can give yourself a copper deficiency. There's an, there's a protein in the intestines called metallothionine, which binds both copper and zinc It kind of uh, helps us to balance that ratio. And if you take a lot of zinc without copper in it, then you can deplete yourself of copper and copper deficiency looks a lot like B12 deficiency. You can get uh, tapes dorsalis or posterior column signs in the, in the neurologic, uh, in the spinal cord, you can get dementias, you can get balance issues and uh, paresthesias in your extremities. So copper deficiency is no joke. And I hear about this all the time. People are taking now 50 milligrams plus of zinc per day because they're worried about a virus. And then if long-term that can lead to problems with hormones and copper deficiency. So I think the best thing is just to uh, get your zinc from meat and organs, and then also to get your copper from a little bit of liver throughout the week at those doses. Does that make sense? Does that, uh, yeah, no, it you? makes, it makes sense. I just, I keep hearing from a lot of different health experts online that, um, anemia isn't really anemia. It's just a copper deficiency, but then again, nobody's talking about organ meats. So it's like, but if we added those in, then why are we even having this conversation? Because you're getting both of those things. And I think it could bring us to a really good topic because everybody that is listening to this might not have a midwife. And so when I'm looking at somebody's blood work, it's going to be completely different than how a standard obstetrician would be looking at blood work. And so typically what is taught throughout out, you know, medical school and how we treat our patients is that we run just a standard CBC, which is a complete blood count. And we look at hemoglobin and hematocrit. And basically what we're told, and even in my licensure, the guidelines from the California Medical Board, it says that if anybody has a hemoglobin under 10.0, they can't have a home birth. And um, so we, it's something that we actually have to use and look at. And I think CBCs are just really easy, great pieces of information just for a little snippet of, of everything but we we have this common perception that you know anemia and pregnancy go hand in hand but i don't think there's a lot of people that talk about the reason why they go hand in hand and the part of the reason is uh, yes there's probably lots of different deficiencies because we're not eating for optimal nutrition for the last 100 years because we've moved away from that farm to table type of of eating but um the hemodilution that happens in pregnancy lowers those hemoglobin levels because of the blood diluting throughout the pregnancy. So we, you know, for me, I always do what's called an obstetrical panel at the beginning of pregnancy. And I get a baseline for what those hemoglobin and hematocrit levels look like. And I actually expect a drop. You know, we, we want to see those levels drop because if it doesn't drop, that tells me that there hasn't been the hemodilution, which is a woman's blood doubling because when she gives birth, she loses blood and we want to have that doubling of blood. So she has those reserves, if you will, postpartum. And so, um, I could have somebody that starts the pregnancy with a normal hemoglobin of 11.5, which to me is low, um, but they feel great. Um, and then I could have somebody start the pregnancy at 13.5 and they start the hemodilution process and drop to 
you know, less than a point and feel like absolute crap. Whereas somebody that drops from 11.5 might not really feel much of a difference. And so I, I kind of want to make sure that the people that are listening know that there is a physiological reason for there to be anemia in pregnancy. But if you are you know, using an animal-based diet and you're using the nutrition of maybe not eating raw liver in your first trimester, but taking those desiccated um, capsules that you're going to have more of an optimal experience throughout the pregnancy. And you won't feel those effects of the hemodilution as much as you would if you were just eating, you know, oatmeal and bagels, so to speak. 